And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Mauro Guillen. We're going to take your calls this hour. Mauro, I wanted to ask you about social media, the Facebook trends, Twitter, which is now called X, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, all these dif- different various outlooks. Do you think that's good, bad, healthy, great for business, not good for business? What do you think? Well, and you forgot about TikTok, but yeah. Yeah, TikTok, uh, that's so right. On TikTok, exactly. So uh, I, I don't think any new technology um, uh, can be defined as being good or universally good or universally bad. It depends on how we use it. Um, the problem is that social media is a very powerful tool. It certainly, certainly helps um, marketers, uh, you know, get their job done. It certainly helps us because we can stay in touch with family and friends and exchange uh, photographs. And it's a lot of fun to be on, on social media. But we also see that social media is a great way of spreading fake news. And it's a great way of, uh, you know, confusing people. And uh, can also be used uh, for fraudulent activities, uh, for money laundering and so on and so forth. So I, I think it really depends on how we use it. It's the same with every kind of technology. Right? Think about nuclear power. Need you back on the phone. Back on the phone. Get back on your phone. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. We can, we can uh, you know, use nuclear power to uh, generate electricity. We can use nuclear power to destroy cities. So every technology can be used for good or evil. It depends on what we want to do. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to Joe in the Bronx. Take it away, Joseph. Hey, how you doing, George? Okay, Joe. Good, good. Yeah, Mauro, I, I wanted to ask you about electric vehicles. Uh, what do you think uh, sales are going to do worldwide on EVs? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the great thing about electric vehicles is that uh, um, they can be used in You know that, right? That we don't shut down a nuclear power station. We don't shut down a coal-fired plant during the night for um, because uh, we need to have it continuously running so that uh, we can keep the demand during the day. So the theory, from my point of view, of electric vehicles is that we can charge them almost at no cost when the electricity is cheap. This is when we have the uh, the car in our garages, right, which is at night. Uh, unfortunately, the problem is that we have great electric vehicles. I think. Some of them designed here in California. Uh, but we don't have the infrastructure in place. We have a gas station at every corner in this country. But you can't charge an electric vehicle uh, everywhere. You really have to plan your trip accordingly. So we need to invest in infrastructure if we want to move in that direction. Which I think it would be great. I mean, electric vehicles reduce pollution, they reduce emissions, there's also a less noise. So think about all of those tracks and buses that uh, you know, bother us so much. Uh, especially in downtown areas. Well, with electric vehicles, all of that uh, would, be, uh, would be gone. Well, all I know is electric vehicles are coming along like crazy. And uh, that's yeah. true. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I I don't know about you, but uh, next time I, I go to the city to get cars, I'll probably get an EV. I still like the old gasoline engines. I, but I wish the I wish the price were better. John in Wisconsin. Hey, John, go ahead. Hello, George. Hello, Moral. George, per usual, excellent guest, excellent topic. I'd like to share two examples that support Moral's book, The Perennials, and also support everything Moral's been talking about this morning. In my two examples, um, let me back up and say my premise of my two examples is what Moral touched on earlier, which is when change happens, you need to change. The first example is my father. In 1985, my father retired at age 54, not by choice, but he worked for a large national company that was broken up by the government, and he was offered the opportunity to move to the other side of the United States or take a severance package. My father did not want to move his family from Wisconsin. He took the severance package, and then he made adjustments in his life, George and Morrill, that was incredible. Something he'd never done before, but he found gifts he had, and he went working uh, in the retail business, and I was just amazed. Well, last Friday, this past Friday, I gave the eulogy at my father's funeral. He was 94. It was a happy eulogy because he lived a happy life. My second example is me. Four years ago, I had an unexpected disability come upon me that forced me to retire. Didn't see it coming and really was thrown for a curve. With full disclosure, Coast to Coast has been a huge part 
of my changes in my life. And I have now used the wisdom I learned from coast to coast with the gifts I have, and I help other people. I share my story. Good for you. I help them through their struggles. I am happier now with my disability than I was four years ago when I was working full time. So tomorrow's point, which was very eloquently stated earlier, you need to make the changes when change comes upon you and your life will be at peace. And Mauro, I want to thank you for all you do. I encourage you to stay healthy and keep up the good work. John, I hear rumors you're going to Columbus, Ohio, too, by the way. Oh, George, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Um, Yes, and I have a traveling companion with me. We have our airline tickets. And uh, my last event in Los Angeles with uh, Coast to Coast was fabulous. We're looking forward to Columbus. Good for you. Go ahead, uh, Mauro. Well, thank you, John. Thank you, John, for sharing those stories. I I think uh, you will inspire many other people who, as you said, suddenly they're confronting a new situation. In your case, it's a little that you didn't have to You're fading again, Merle. You You're do? fading again. What, what do you do? You reinvent yourself. You try to look for another way to have a life. And uh, I, I think uh, your stories will inspire uh, quite a few people out there. So thank you for sharing them. Danny in Oklahoma City is with us. Hey, Danny, go ahead. Hi, George. Uh, we have a good show as usual. Uh, my uh, father, too, by the way, he uh, he would have turned 100 years old uh, this month, in fact. And, uh, and, and Merle, uh, I guess we're about the same age. I'm only a couple of months from my 60th birthday. And one thing I will say about, you know, baby boomers, you know, we... <laughs> I guess uh, we we were kind of born, many of us, you know, in between two ages. You know, we we spent a lot of years, you know, long before, you know, the uh, Internet came out or, you know, cell phones. Uh, and so we kind of know what it was like on, you know, both sides, you know, with those, uh, those two eras. But um, a couple of quick uh, thoughts I'd like to run by you sure. is um, what what can be done – uh, so the American people, especially, uh, can recognize whenever they're being fed propaganda, whether it's through you know, uh, you know, high school, college, or even through the media. And then, two, I would like your finally your thoughts to you too, George, on uh, this uh, digital currency that they're really pushing. You know, the state of Texas, and even here in Oklahoma and Arkansas, and I think about a dozen states overall. They're proposing, instead of a central digital banking currency, where the government would pretty much control people's accounts, uh, instead offer a digital currency that's backed by gold that the account holder would hold, and he he or she can uh, make withdrawals, a transaction from that gold through the digital currency. That way you truly still own your money. If you can trust them, Danny, I, I've never been a fan of digital currency at all. I like cash. Moro, what about you? Well, I think uh, we're in the early stages. More than what they are today, which is essentially. And so people are, some people are making money, and some people are losing money. Uh, but, you know, I think... Has uh, so many inefficiencies to move money around. Uh, digital currencies, whether it's by the government or by a company or a computer, like Bitcoin, have the potential of reducing costs, financial costs, and making our life easier. Uh, but I completely agree with both of you because all right, and Murr, I'm going to have to cut this interview with you short, sir. I'm sorry, but uh, your phone is just so bad. Uh, technically, we just can't keep doing it. Those of you on hold, we're going to do calls between you and me in an open line forum. So the same questions you have, we will continue to talk. Let me go back to you, Danny, in Oklahoma. Uh, I'm not sure the gold backing of digital currency is going to succeed. Uh, do you think it'll really work? I don't know, George. I mean, I, I've been hearing a little bit more about it, some rumblings on various, you know, uh, talk shows on the radio, like through, you know, Frank Gaffney. You you had him on uh, not too long ago. He had a 
something on it. And um, but I'm I'm with you though, as far as I I'm I'm a I've always been kind of a cash person. I probably got that from my parents. I mean, I do have a, you know, for years I didn't have a credit card till I was like 40 years, you know, or 35, 40 years old, and I did that just to establish a line of credit, you know. But uh, and so that's nice to have, you know, like when you're, you know. Uh, Taking up your car or something, you know, get in and out. But, um, but yeah, I I would just like I I think a lot of our problems that we are seeing today is because people are just being fed so much propaganda. And I think your guest even alluded to that how, you know, with social media people are being confused. So George, what do you think can be done so more Americans can realize when they're being fed, you know, propaganda? You know, what's true, what's you know. Well, fortunately, with programs like ours, where we continue trying to bring you the truth and uh, let people open up their eyes a little bit more about what's happening in society, that uh, will continue to help. I mean, we're going through, in my lifetime, I have never experienced the topsy-turviness that we're going through with everything, every area that you can talk about, the food you buy in stores, the elections, which, you know, we try not to do a lot of politics on this program, but uh, it's becoming more and more of a news <laughs> news event, especially when a former president gets indicted four times on various charges. It's incredible. So this world is upside down, and we've got to be able to keep at it. And um, it's not easy for a lot of people to face. Uh, I look at my two great-grandchildren, great-grandchildren. I've got six grandchildren, but the little ones are four and two. And I'm wondering, what's this world going to be like 20 years from now for all of those folks? Let's go to Jeremy in North Dakota. How's the birthday boy been this month? Oh, I think I've been doing great. Good for you. I was calling in to say I think I'm a very unique demographic. Yes, you are. You you you, you still buy goods and stuff, don't you, even though you had that horrible accident? Uh, yeah, I... Uh, I've been uh, reduced to uh, when I purchase a vehicle, I just have to buy a electric mobility. You drive those still, don't you? Um, I drive mobility scooters. I'm not allowed to drive a car. Okay. Because the judge says I'm too incompetent to do that. I don't know about that. But would you drive a car if they gave you the medical approval to do that? Oh, definitely. You would. Do you miss yeah, driving? I, I'm, I'm hoping that my uh, investment in Renova Health turns out really well, and I'm a billionaire. Has that gone up at all since you bought it? Uh, it's gone up and down. It goes up and down just about every day. Still at point zero 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 zero, whatever it is. Well, it's at point to zero 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 one how much money now jeremy how much money did you put into this um i put in uh about four thousand dollars all right so if you lose it all you're not crushed right right okay good that's smart that's the way to do it but uh if i turn out according to the projections um it's projected that within the next year to be selling at 97 dollars and Ninety-seven dollars from point zero 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 one. Yep. Well, who's telling you that? It's uh, I looked it up on a website called uh, uh, WalletInvestor dot com where it projects all kinds of stuff. Well, be careful. Be careful what you do. But uh, had Merle still been able to hang around, his phone was just too bad. What question would you have asked him? Um, I, I was going to ask him um, what demographic that I fit in, being the fact that the, when I was in my coma from my accident over 19 and a half years ago, the doctor's best suggestion for me was that I would be a human vegetable in the rest of my life, and I had a truncated lifespan of only 32. And you're in your and 40s, I, so I would I guess you're, you're, you're Generation Xer, aren't you? Yep, I'm 48 years old. But you don't act it, and you don't sound it. You sound much younger. Uh, I'm getting really old. 
Don't talk to me about getting old, Jeremy. Thanks a lot for being on the program. We're going to continue with uh, these calls in an open line forum for the rest of this hour. Next hour, we're going live to Europe, where we're going to talk about Atlantis. So make sure you're part of the program. Let's go to uh, Tom's got a text or tweet for me. What do you got, Tommy? Hey, George, in from Jason in Oakland, California. What do you think it would take for the next president elected to tell the truth about government knowledge of UFOs? That's a good question. I do not believe most, if not all, presidents have been told about UFOs. So I don't think there's anything they can say to us, Tom. I, I, I don't think they know. See, I think they do know. I just think they don't think we're ready. I think it's as easy as that. You think uh, Carter knew, Bill Clinton, George Bush? Do you think that? You know, I watch these guys like, for instance, um, uh, you can take anyone, any of the late, the late night shows and the guys that interview them. And there have been cases where they'll just ask them point blank and they'll make a joke. But you watch their eyes and you know they know something. I think that. I'm not sure. I think Richard Nixon did because he apparently took Jackie Gleason, the comedian, to Homestead Air Force Base and showed him an E.T. in a jar. I think Clinton did. He might have, but I'm not sure. sure. I watched their face. Let's go next to Joe, Long Island, New York. Joseph, we got you. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, George. On this particular topic, uh, my question for Maura would have been uh, people that have career turns, setbacks, uh, would you, in terms of taking stock, you're supposed to be humble, but maybe err on the side of overrating yourself rather than underrating yourself. Do you think that's better to think, you, you know, kind of take that approach, maybe if need be, overrate your abilities to keep your confidence up and, and maybe you'll do more. Well, what do you think, Chuck? Uh, sometimes that's not a bad idea. I mean, when you go in for a job interview, you don't want to underrate yourself. You want to oversell yourself, if, if possible, to convince them that uh, you're the person for the job. So that's that's not a bad idea, Joe. Yeah, and on China, uh, you know how they do this disassembly where uh, – one factory in Thailand makes one part of the product, say it's a car, and then China, another part, another country, another part. Do you see quality control issues with that or uh, even dangers in that? Absolutely. I, absolutely. There's all kinds of problems with China. And uh, they're starting to crack down on their health programs right now. They're concerned about that. And uh, my biggest concern with China right now is Taiwan. I think they're watching Russia and Ukraine. They're watching how we specifically handle the situation, and they're going to make a decision based on that, and uh, that concerns me a lot. Uh, And as you know, in Taiwan, it's the world's biggest manufacturer of chips for computers and cars and everything else, and we can ill afford to let that country go into the hands of some other nation with all that kind of technology that's out there, to be sure. Anyways, we're going to come back with more of these so-called open lines. And thank you, by the way, for understanding. Uh, Morrow's phone was just a little too bad for me, and uh, we will be back with more. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. Let's go right back to you. Your caller's Eric Truck Driving in Indiana, one of our buddies. Hey, Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you, George, and glad to be on the show tonight. It's Friday, it's clear, and... Well, we're having all kinds of fun out here. I want to talk about, you know, uh, a little bit about uh, determination and dedication and all that, you know, mindset and stuff. My dad, you know, he would have been 100 years old uh, next April. And, you know, he grew up in the Depression days, and he had an attitude like, yeah, I used to say when I was a kid, oh, I can't do that. He said, there ain't no such thing as you can't. Well, he was right, really. You know, I mean, you get that mindset, you can do anything you want to do, you know. So um, I just wanted to comment on that. You know, I worked at a um, at a factory before I started driving a truck, but I knew a little bit about trucking, too. Uh, the factory, you know, they, 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 they had a big meeting, and they said that uh, they come up with the word pace, and the – the letters in the word means positive attitude. Pos- positive attitude changes everything. And, boy, it stuck with me forever, you know? Yep. So, so uh, I just think that, um, 
if a person is determined and they'll make it. You know, I think we're going to make it through all this stuff and everything, but the only thing is, is that what really, it really kind of boggles my mind is on um, what the people, what what's going to happen with the people's uh, Social Security check when they change the di- digital currency. You know, I guess that is digital currency, but what's going to happen with that? You know what I'm saying? Well, you're probably going to need a bank account, and they'll just send the money straight to that account, but... I don't like digital. I like cash. I like keeping a little cash in my pocket. Don't you? Oh yes, sir. Yeah. Oh yeah. A little bit. You know. I mean, I, I don't see how you can how you can uh, operate that way. Really, with just just uh, just a uh, just try to be, you know, not knowing uh, how much you really have. I mean, really, because all you're looking at is numbers on a on a computer or what have you, or on a bill or what have you, you never see the, you never see the currency. Hey, Eric, have you truck drivers talked amongst each other about driverless trucks? Yeah, well, not really, but um, you know, I've seen a, I've seen, you know, I was talking about um, the electric EVs. You know, uh, I've seen an ad in where uh, GM is having a problem with uh, the EVs. They, they made, I think. Uh, some one month and they only sold like two and now they're having problems with getting the batteries you know uh and 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 they cut they said they had to um put that to the side for about a month you know because they couldn't get the batteries (laughs) what else you know but electric trucks um I don't think that'll ever work because you still got to have somebody to go out and open the doors and drop the hook and all that stuff, you know. How are you going to do that, you know? And unload it and everything else. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't see how that's going to work, really. Just like everything else, you know, with electric cars, you know. I know. I know leaving the network in Los Angeles at 2 in the morning, and you see sometimes these trucks parked outside food stores and restaurants at two in the morning out that way, unloading food and stuff like that, getting their inventory in stock. How's it going to happen with a driverless truck? Text and uh, tweets. What do we have, Tom? Or should I say now, instead of tweets, <laughs> text and X? <laughs> X. This one from Caroline in West uh, Wisconsin. What is your opinion on what makes the news media so biased? She says there must be a reason. I'll answer that and then hang because I have a question about Columbus that I haven't been able to ask you yet. But uh, the question about the media and what, biasness? She wants to know why you think they're so biased. Well, in the old days, the Walter Cronkite days, you you never got opinions from newscasters. Right. Now it's everything, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, you name it. It's opinion. It's it's opinion television. They they really aren't newscasters anymore. They're they're hosts with opinions. So they just need to tell them, don't give us your opinion. Exactly. And you know the straight news is not there anymore. I, I mean I haven't had time to watch it on the network. The newscasts that they have, the nightly news, but I don't think it's as bad as the cable networks. No, not quite. But. Anyways, back to Columbus. We've okay. got tickets selling like crazy. They're going How well. long are they going to continue selling the tickets? I have some friends who have not bought yet, but they want to know when some of the last times are. Oh, up till day of. Day of. They'll still be, if they're, as long as they're there to and available, they will sell them. And there's a different tier of prices or not? Yeah, there's two tiers. Two tiers. And they would be upstairs and down or what? Upstairs, downstairs, and uh, the way the back are the less expensive ones. The last time we were at Columbus, you surprised me with my mother on stage. 2019, Mother's Day. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't the... believe you couldn't see them in the audience. I, I Look, when I'm in the audience, I'm just looking at one or two people. That's how I've always done my shows. That's how I concentrate. <laughs> they were right there, so, man. So I didn't, I didn't see them. I was sitting there all where, show. Where, whereabouts were they? They were, if you're standing looking at the audience, they were probably four to six rows to your left. And all show, I was just sitting there going, telling Lori, he's going to see him. He's going to see him. Did not notice them at all. That was a great surprise. That's something. And that was the tragic weekend 
of Stanton Friedman. We lost Stanton, and he had called me. I, I may be one of the last people to ever speak to him. They changed his reservation, and we had to scramble to help him out. But I had talked to him right before he we went to the airport. That's something else. Yeah. Okay, let's take some final calls here. Ron in Michigan, welcome to the show. Hey, Ronald, go ahead. Good morning, George. George, I have a question before I get my, the question I originally called. Okay. The song uh, Richmond North of uh, Richmond, it, isn't that sound a whole lot like Darius Drucker's Roll Me Like a Wagon Wheel? It's very similar to it. You're right. Very similar. Yeah, so the, there's some plagiarism, I think, going on there. <laughs> but anyway, what, what I, I wanted to ask, and I always ask, with all this new technology, you, and you just hit it with batteries, water. Where are we going to get the water? Because we need fresh water in every river in the world, the Mekong, the Euphrates, the Mississippi. You name the river, the St. Joe River around here. They're all running dry. They're all running dry. The Colorado. And more people are being born every day. Where are we going to get that, that one resource that's irreplaceable unless we can change the salt water, which I don't think is going to happen? We don't have the water. You, are, you are right. We are literally up a creek if we don't do something about fresh water. And I think we should be putting, as you just mentioned, desalinization plants all along the coasts and take in that ocean water, which is unlimited. I mean, the oceans, folks, will never run dry, not as long as we're around. So use uh, desalinization plants and make uh, fresh water out of it, which you can do. And uh, start piping it in all over the place. That would be amazing, to be sure. Mark in Raleigh, North Carolina is with us. Hey, Mark, thanks for calling. Yeah, hey, George. Uh, I know your feelings about the uh, the uh, self-driving uh, vehicles, particularly trucks, when it comes yes. to transfer trucks. And I, had a, uh, I have similar feelings, but uh, for a different reason than you. Um, my feeling is I, I had an encounter last night with one of these new GM Cruise self-driving vehicles. And it was late at night. It had a human driver behind the wheel, but these are new to my city of Raleigh. And ah. uh, my belief is they're out uh, driving after hours when there's no traffic to, you know, gather data with their sensors. It had a huge sensor array on it. So it was taking in all of the surroundings, the lights, you know, the various, you know, stop signs, things like this. But my objection to them, and from what I've heard from other large cities that have this uh, system, particularly San Francisco, is that they, they don't seem to be programmable for the human factor, for things like empathy, sympathy, self-sacrifice. And decision-making. And, they, they, they don't make decisions. And, uh, yes, and you can't program for that yet. You can no. program for stop signs, stop lights, curves, turns, but you cannot add that human factor, that human soul to the system. No, you're absolutely right. And what was that situation they had in San Francisco where 10 robo-taxis all stopped at the same time and blocked That's traffic. Correct. Oh my That's god! Correct. And another one ran over a dog there and killed a dog. Uh, and one years ago hit a woman, I think, in Arizona. I I remember that because I was in Arizona visiting at that time. It killed her. It did. It did. So uh, unfortunately, North Carolina is not up to the times with uh, permits and things for this. So they can do what they like here for now, but. I think there's going to be a huge um, leap forward in the law. Or there's going to have to be to regulate these things. But I do think they're coming for, for better or worse, George. Well, I, I think it's for worse, to tell you the truth, Mark. Thanks for the call. Tom in Riverside, California is with us. Hello, Thomas. Oh, George. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to say a couple things about it. I think we're moving a little too fast on the technology. I mean, with the batteries, you know, you know, uh, and stuff that that's the biggest problem is just coming up with all that stuff. And uh, I think a lot of the resources for that has been tied up uh, from China and buying up a lot of the, you know, the mines and yep. the supply. And I seen something on TV today about the Chinese Navy, you know, they're building four to R1 of naval oh. ships. Oh, they're going crazy. They, they yeah, really are. Submarines, and they're, you know, they're, got their eyes on the, their patrolling around Australia and the, the South China Sea. I mean, it's just a matter of time, you know. And uh, it's uh, it's too bad we can't really talk to those people and just 
you know, we haven't got the people. I think we got a guy that's tied up in court right now that's really the answer. And I think a lot of people feel that way because he's about, what, 40% uh, in the polls compared to the, everybody else that's going yeah, on. Yeah, despite everything that's happened to the guy, he still leads in the polls. And it's remarkable that we have that guy. He doesn't have to do that. He, he could have just took and went somewhere with his money and enjoyed the rest of his life. But he's fighting like crazy to try and deal with them all through his presidency and right now, too. But other than that, uh, uh, he's a man for the job. He can work with both China and Russia. And uh, if we're not careful, those two are going to get together because we're pushing them, you know, and it's going to uh, it's going to end up going that way. Uh, another thing is I've seen another thing on TV or well on the Internet uh, with the UFOs. And up until this point, but after seeing that hearing, I kind of, you know, I really never seen a ghost. I've never seen a flying saucer or really don't know of anybody I really grew up with or anybody that really has, you know, really said they've seen, except maybe a nephew. I'm, I'm not too sure about that. But uh, I today, it seemed like there was a lot of credibility in what those people were saying. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And uh, so that could be, but uh, whatever happens, it doesn't matter, you know, uh, that's okay. Whatever happens is going to happen. But I think we need to slow down on the technology, don't you? I mean, with the these driverless cars, and we need to just take a, you know, my parents, my uncles, they were all well-balanced people. You know, well, you, well, let me tell you, Tom, let me tell you this. You can't really slow down technology because competition will pick it up somewhere else. But I think you can pass laws to say, no driverless vehicles on our roads. It's not going to happen. We don't care how sophisticated these vehicles get. We will not allow driverless vehicles. I mean, would you like to be behind in front of a truck on a, a six-inch snowstorm with a driverless truck behind you speeding at 60 miles an hour? Now, maybe during the snowstorm, the mechanics of the truck say, slow down to 25 but still, I, I want a human being behind the wheel, good or bad, making decisions and uh, deciding what they're going to do. And, uh, and that's, that's scary times. Let's go to Jerry in Iowa. Squeeze you in before the break. Jerry, go ahead. Uh, hi, George. You are extremely groovy, and I love you. You're very kind. Uh, we're in, uh, this is North Central Iowa, Buddy Holly, last gig territory. Oh, that's Near right. The surf ballroom. That's right. I, uh, old friends who used to go there and dance even before Buddy was there. So um, uh, earlier, the demographics discussion was really interesting. And uh, regarding, like, world religions and everything, I'm curious about the population uh, around the world. Uh, particularly in the U.S., that is dedicated to, to Jesus, and if that might be having some sort of a positive effect on really difficult world uh, political and other situations. I think it is, Jerry. I think you need spirituality in your system somewhere. I was raised as a Roman Catholic. Uh, I'm not a, uh obsessed churchgoer by any means. Uh, and I went to uh, what we call the catechism classes. Those were kids who went to public schools but wanted to pick up more on the Catholic religion. And I think it gave me a basis and a good foundation. And, you know, my belief is my belief system, to be sure. But uh, I think uh, it's very conceivable that if you have that belief system and a higher power, you're a different kind of a person. That's important. Anyways, we're going live to the United Kingdom next to talk about Atlantis. Wait till you hear what Graham Phillips has to say.